All right, welcome. So tonight we're going to go through a couple of Enfield rifles, except that's not... Where's my other Enfield, dude? Oh, this one. Always trying to steal my Gucci shit. Well, that'll be an upcoming video. So, we're going to cover a couple, uh, couple of Enfield rifles tonight. Um, pictured on the table here we have in front of us, we have two... Uh, period era original rifles that are both uh, Enfield in design. The uh, top is an Eddie Stone M1917 rifle, a U.S. military rifle from the First World War, and the bottom is a, a short magazine Lee Enfield number one Mark III Star rifle from the British Empire from the First World War with accompanying uh, period correct bayonets. So uh, we'll get into uh, get into a little bit of a breakdown in the history behind them and the. Uh, the similarities and differences and sort of the lineage as the, the lineage of what they are. All right, so looking at these two rifles here today, uh, these, these are both quintessential World War I era rifles uh, from the Allied side of the First World War, the Great War. Um, the rifle on the bottom is the older rifle. Uh, this gun was produced in 1917. And if we zoom in here, you can see the markings on the receiver. But we have our, our crown marking with our GR. Speaking for uh, King George V, who was the uh, the king of, in power in England at the time of the First World War, the British Empire. Um, you'll see it's marked BSA, which stands for the British Small Arms Corporation, um, which was the factory that produced this. And then you'll have the year of production is there, 1917. And then underneath, underneath that you'll see where it says um, SMLE with a three and a star. And this is a short magazine Lee Enfield number three star or number one Mark three star. This was the most common Enfield rifle in World War I. Um, the rifle above it uh, came to be also during World War I, but on the American side. And there's a very interesting story of how the rifle above this uh, became used in, in the First World War. So speaking about the, the SNLE, the British rifle first, uh, the British rifle SNLE, uh, came, for, uh, came from the original Lee Enfield rifles, which was used by the British Empire during the Boer War in the late 1800s. Um, by the time the First World War, beginning in 1914, came around, the SMLE in chambered in 303 British, a 30 caliber round, was the, uh, was the standard issue rifle of the British Army. The uh, number three, uh, the Mark III star, <clears throat> the star refers to a few improvements uh, on the receiver, one of which is this uh, this bridge mount here to help help add a strip of clip and help secure the receiver a little more. Um, another note on this particular example is it does have uh, it does have a little bit of antiquated um, a volley fire sight. The back portion of uh, the rear portion of the uh, a volley fire sight used for firing firing at some very uh, very ambitious ranges. But this is uh, this is a period correct uh, World War One era rifle. This is actually reproduction sling on here. Um, Couple features of this rifle that are interesting: the Lee Enfields are cock on close. So as I open this, you see how the, the I open this bolt; it springs to the rear. That spring action, and you see here it's difficult. You get pressure. I push it forward to lock it down to cock to cock it. It cocks on close, not cock on open. A lot of more modern bolt action rifles cock on opening the action. You'll see here this is an empty rifle, empty magazine, and a chamber. You'll notice the locking lugs for this bolt are also on the rear of the bolt and interact with the rear portion of the receiver. There's no locking lugs at the front of the receiver, or at the front of the bolt into the into the chamber of the receiver. The magazine is actually detachable on this weapon, which is a, a feature that probably was very underutilized in the First World War. The these have what's called a, a pug, pug nose design, and that pug nose design has a bayonet lug at the rear and a notch here which allow the very uh, a 1907 pattern sword style bayonet to be attached. And there's just a very simple cross bolt design that logs on that locks on the pug nose and it locks into this here. And this will, uh, as history went on, rifles got shorter and bayonets both got shorter. But as you can see, this uh, gives you a pretty awesome extension uh, of, your, of your weapon system when you're, uh, and this was a, this was a 10 round magazine. For when you're uh, when you ran out of ammunition, so I'll move that move that bayonet off. I'll show a few markings on the bayonet, but you can see this is actually um, uh, marked 1907 for your production for this bayonet, and it should. And this is a I believe it get the lighting correct. 
This is a Sanders company, which is a was a contract a contract factory for the bayonets. Um, this is a 1907 produced bayonet. I'm, I may have misspoke and said this this was a 1907 pattern. I don't recall off the top of my head. Um, and then you have the uh, the leather leather scabbard for this bayonet. And you'll note the height of the ring above this bayonet is nearly directly above the uh, the top of the, the top of the blade. So. Albeit this was the rifle of the at the beginning of World War I, prior to the beginning of World War I, earlier in 1914, World War I began in August of 1914, um, the, you know, all the powers declared by the end of the summer there in 1914, the actual uh, beginning of the conflict in June, beginning of the events that led to the conflict in June, I should say. But earlier in 1914, the British sought out to replace the short magazine Lee Enfield with a more modern version of, of, the, of the Lee Enfield rifle. And the, the nomenclature for that rifle that was supposed to be produced was known as the P-14. It was also supposed to be chambered in 303 British, and the P-14 looked identical to what you see sitting on the top here. And this is a U.S. M-1917 Enfield rifle. So you may ask, well, how did uh, the, the, the story and how we got to an American rifle being uh, coming from a British design has everything to do with, with uh, um, contract capacity and um, you know the U.S.'s economic power during that time. So when the British decided to, uh, the British uh, in in 1914 had this design finalized like it. And you'll note that um, although it has an internal uh, internal box magazine, you'll see the aperture sights, um, the much longer sight radius, the the aperture sights. Um, you'll notice again a cock on open, but you have receiver lugs that are in the front of the receiver, a much stronger receiver. A much more modern, modern design. Um, no remnants of volley fire stuff. No, uh, no single feed. Um, just, a, just a more robust um, modern bolt action rifle. Uh, you'll notice on the uh, the SMLE, you have a, a notch sight and a very fine front sight, a much shorter sight radius, a much more uh, complicated ladder style sight, much older than the uh, the aperture style sights. So for those those other reasons, um, stronger rifle overall. Uh, simpler to produce rifle overall. The British were going to transition to this. However, once the First World War kicked off, um, the ability to transition rifles isn't during the middle of the war. So the British ended up sticking with the SMLE throughout World War I and subsequently stuck with an updated design, the number four Mark I, uh, through World War II. But the P-14 in, in 1914 was supposed to be their new, their new infantry rifle. They contracted with um, a, with a company known as Eddystone, uh, was actually a subsidiary of Remington, the the, the U.S. company Remington, um, to produce these rifles. However, once uh, and Remington did produce some Eddystone uh, 303 British P14s for for England. Uh, however, um, as the U.S. began as the U.S. began to uh, to enter the war and, and tool up for tool up for war. The United States is the United States had adopted in 1903 the Springfield 1903 rifle as the standard issue infantry rifle. Well, as war was approaching and, and once we once we in, became involved in the conflict in 1917, the decision was made to utilize the manufacturing capacity at the Eddystone plant and I believe one other to manufacture these rifles for the United States to supplement our 1903 production. So they simply rechambered it in 30 6 Springfield instead of 303 British, um, which led to a reduced magazine capacity by one round. Uh, but then we, the American M1917 Enfield rifle was born. Um, and two interesting facts about the M1917, there were actually more MC, M1917 rifles serving in the Western Front in France and uh, in the Low Countries. There were more of them than uh, M1903. So even though the M1903 was our Marine Corps Army standard issue rifle, the, the Enfield actually was produced, uh, produced in, in excess numbers and served, uh, served a lot. Overseas, um, the uh, again the, the the USM 1903 has the old school sights um, versus the uh, these were preferred a little bit longer and heavier the Enfield is than the uh, than the 1903. Um, two other inter another interesting fact, uh, you know the, the famous Medal of Honor winner soldier Alvin York uh, was likely carrying it's not known for sure but was likely carrying an M 1917 rifle. Um, so the example we have here today is marked. U.S. model of 1917 Eddystone, which the Eddystone factory um, was where these where these were produced. And this is uh, you know actually a period era, although it'll be a little damaged, a period era 1918 sling which has survived. Um, and that brings us to the issue of the uh, the American bayonet. So you'll notice the American bayonet looks very similar to the British bayonet. 
the uh, two distinct differences are uh, overtly are your two gouges in both sides of the handle and you'll notice the ring is much higher above the handle. So when we look at the Eddy Stone, bayonet lugs on the bottom, it interacts there. You'll notice the gap here, whereas the British Enfield design had the pug nose notched down here. So just that, that differentiating, differentiating height is the main difference. And when the United States also produced um, not the same pattern bayonet as the 1903 Springfield, however, when the U.S. began producing a Winchester Model 1897 trench shotguns in 12 gauge, uh, this was the actual bayonet issued with that trench gun, and the heat shield that was installed uh, had the bayonet adapter uh, with the lug and the and the bayonet n a notch on the front of it of those for the shotguns. This was actually the bayonet used. And an interesting thing you'll see on these bayonets is you'll see there was actually two markings for this to become a British bayonet, um, but they simply replaced the hilt here. And they scratch, these are called markovers. They overstamped the, uh, the the stampings and marked U.S. And, in the position there. And this is a I believe 1913 produced produced bayonet, um, marked 1913. So this was simply repurposed for the U.S. portion. And these two notches, these two notches here, I'll show you the markings a little better. But these two notches. Um, were used to delineate these so that you didn't pick up the wrong bayonet or try to use the wrong bayonet with the wrong rifle. The American bayonets had the two notches. So a very similar shared history. The two rifles are linked, hence both being known as infields. But you have the British infield and the American infield for short. Um, but that's the, uh, that's the main differences between the two. And uh, they both served valiantly for the Allies in the First World War. The, um, uh, the, there, were, there were millions of these rifles produced. Uh, referring to the, the U.S. Enfield, uh, when you talk about World War II history, uh, these were pretty much relegated to domestic um, military home guard style duties, National Guard armories, things along those uh, those lines. The uh, by by World War II, the U.S. had pretty much transitioned, you know, to the M1 Grand for primary troops. Uh, but the uh, 1903 A3, the Springfield rifle, um, post World War One took over as the bolt action rifle and the, and the kind of the secondary service rifle during World War II. These did not see overseas action in World War II to any any significant extent or none that I'm aware of. Um, the, the, the British uh, uh, number one Mark III's, uh, some of them did, uh, did, especially early on in the war, the Battle of France in 1940, uh, were certainly pressed into service and did still did see, uh, see frontline service in the Second World War as well. But these are, these are two World War I guns. Uh, the example on top, if I didn't mention before, this is 1918 produced, albeit marked 1917. And who knows the stories these rifles can tell. Well, at the very least, we know by the serial numbers on the receivers that these, these rifles were you know, produced and available for military service during the years uh, during the, the final two years of the First World War, and uh, it's very possible they, uh, they saw action, or it's very possible they didn't, but um, very cool uh, very cool pieces in the collection. I will show one other thing on the, on the bayonet. This is very interesting, but the, uh, the bayonet is marked from Dave McDougall, France, 1919, and on the top it's, um, it says to, I think it's Jeb Morrison, um, no address inscribed, but this was likely uh, this was likely a company with a piece of paper with an address with some postage uh, shipped back, and probably a U.S. soldier, U.S. soldier, an occupation duty or servant in 1919 after the armistice was signed prior to the Treaty of Versailles, and probably sent this back home, um, or it's just to bring back and they marked uh, marked the in inscribes on it, but or a gift given to someone, but likely the way it's uh, the way it's carved in there was likely a send back. So another piece of uh, piece of history from well over 100 years ago. So. But that's the tale of two infields, and that's, uh, that's what we have in front of us today. And with that, we'll probably move into to breaking down the bolts and uh, breaking down the rifles, showing the basic field, field stripping, and uh, something cool that my esteemed colleague here built for being able to take down our infield bolt to, uh, to its, all of its parts. So, Thanks for watching, and if you liked it, give us a thumbs up, and throw it in the comments if you've got any experience with these guns. And don't forget to follow, because we're going to come back to these in the future. I'm not going to be kind of gay about it, but your voice is kind of perfect. <laughs>